Hello and welcome to Films and That, the show where we talk about films that no one usually talks about. My name's Rob Turnbull. And my name's Sam Hall. And Sam, what are we talking about this week? Uh, this week, Rob, we're talking about Werkmeister Harmonies, a film by Bellatar. Made in the year 2000, Werkmeister Harmonies is based on the 1989 novel The Melancholy of Resistance and the writings of musical theorist Andreas Werkmeister. The film details the strange events that cause civil unrest in a post-war Hungarian town. The plot follows Janos as he sort of bumbles through town, uh, completing a few domestic tasks for different people. Um, he seems to be doing the odd job. He, he seems to be a compassionate man. In amongst all of that is the, this defining moment of this town, which I believe represents a kind of revolution or an invasion. The, the, the defining thing that changes it all is the arrival of this circus which has two attractions. One is the carcass of a large whale, and the second is this enigmatic prince character who only ever seen shadow but brings chaos to the town. So a lot of the scenes do play out in very, very long takes, and it kind of rejects a lot of modern editing techniques. I mean, there's only like 39, a lot of people are saying 39 or 35 shots, depending on which version of the film you see. Yeah, I counted 35 you on my version. <laughs> You so, can blame uh, artificial eye for that. <laughs> <laughs> the camera starts filming long before and long after the, all the action has taken place, and you are you just forced to stay with these characters. The, the camera dances around Janos in particular. The, the, the dances around all the time, but at the same time, we're still seeing things that you would you would cut out of a Hollywood film, just naturally. It can be testing for a lot of people, but I think it. I don't think you could see this film without that. I think that that just makes what the film what it is. Yeah, it's a common again. It's a common thing with Bellatar, um, and it harkens back to Tarkovsky uh, and his use yeah. of, of of time. I think you know. I think there is a, a certain connection that in one interview I've seen that Tar makes of 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 time being a kind of what we understand of time being a human construction and how how it, it, it doesn't really connect to us all the grand scale of the universe you know what we term as night and day and the years and the calendar is literally just some spheres revolving around each other and ultimately you know time is is relative so they used german actors for funding reasons is that right i think so uh don't yeah um I imagine that there's not a huge amount of well-known Hungarian actors out there. Um, the reality of film is that you often do need some kind of star attraction to bring, um, you know, to, to bring in funding. Uh, Janos himself was in Run, Lola, Run. That's one of my favourite films and I had to look him up. Yeah, to, to make sure there it's, there. it's a, it's a it's, bit it's, part. It's, yeah, I can't imagine he's in it that much. Yeah, uh, but there, there is also Hannah Shigula. Uh, who is a very well-known German actress, if you know German cinema. She worked frequently with Rainer Werner Fassbinder, uh, which is a bit of a mouthful, but um, if you're aware of his work, he's actually a man who Bellatar uh, relates to and actually inspired him quite a lot. So I think because uh, they use these German actors, uh, as I understand it, the Hungarian language is quite difficult to speak and obviously it's a native Hungarian film, you've got to present it to the Hungarian nation. So uh, they felt that the best way to, to speak to Hungarian people was to dub over the, the German actors, uh, just, just, just so that they could, the Hungarians could relate to the film a bit better. The effect of dubbing over in a different language is um, they effectively have to mute the diegetic sound, the, what they've recorded on location, and then add the doubling over and then add sound effects and foley over the top which gives them an opportunity to be more creative with the sound and because um, they've got to literally add footsteps and everything back on so people would walk from one end of a really long street to the other with just no real visual changing and no no audio changing very repetitive footsteps like almost on the beat of each other yeah and it's, it's almost hypnotic and it's almost mesmerising to watch. Uh, 
I think some some of the dubbing is okay. It's just they focus on it quite a lot. It, you, you've got a lot of at, at the first. You've got a close up of Janosch talking about this eclipse situation, and um, you, you do no, you really do notice it. Olyan magyarázatot kapunk, amiből mi egyszerű emberek is megérthetünk valamit a halhatatlanságból. Um, it's just quite odd to see, I think, in a film that was made in the year 2000. Which is another interesting point. It doesn't feel like a like a modern film. No, anyway. not at all. Not just no. not just because it's in black and white and whatever, but it's um, just the way it, it's shot and long takes and just the tone of it just feels very 70s or... Must take you back to the Midlands, eh? Okay. Well, because it's depressing. Yeah, and dark. And grey. Yeah. The yeah, the choreo choreography is quite good. When the writers go to the hospital and start attacking people, there's lots in that, lots going on, and you feel like you're a participant in it. I think. Going back to that, actually, do you think there's something to be said about about some that sometimes the focal point is something almost insignificant and uh, sorry to go back to, to his other film Satan's Tango but there's a lot of that there's a lot of there'll be a conversation going on and then the the, the camera might focus on a, a table or, or or a window you know yeah. focus on something completely insignificant do you think there's anything to be said about that there, there's a woman talking about uh, the foreshadowing all, all the horrible events that are supposed to happen from the arrival of this whale. We immediately know that this whale is supposed to be a bad thing. But it's just a great moment, I think, with the, the camera very, very slowly pulls focus away from Janosch, who is just reading a newspaper at this point, and very slowly moves you in to this character, who, this woman who's just foreshadowing what's going to happen. Mm. And uh, there's actually a little um, sort of barred window thing. Um, and you know it slowly moves in so that that, that becomes the frame mm. that, it, that it literally you know helps you to focus I guess on what you're trying to see there's a few things actually I think where the, the sound is not the focus it takes a little a few moments you know to sort of move that in, into the frame about what you want to see it's like it's like it's sort of trying to build up of what, what you want to see is not necessarily what it's going to show you but it, it will make you listen to it The whale. The whale. When you when you first hear someone mention a whale, it kind of you're just like what? Yeah. Well, the the first time I saw the film, you know, that that was the the bizarre element. Um, my immediate reaction was thinking of people like David Lynch, of, yeah. of, of trying to think trying to think of the symbolism that, that this might relate to. But then even even all the characters in the film talk about it as just being a whale's carcass. You know. Yeah. They they're afraid of it. Um, in the moments when Janos looks at the whale, walks around it, and it's quite a beautiful moment in a way. Um, as soon as he leaves the trailer that the whale is housed in, someone comes up to him and says, what did you think, what did you see? And he said, nothing, it's just a whale, it's just one of God's creations. Um, and the person he speaks to says, oh, I don't like it, I don't like it. Um, there's something up. And I, f I feel that that represents the lead character's uh, naivety. Uh, I've seen one person describe him as a wise fool because um, he is sort of as a as a figure of of intelligence as someone that people can um, learn things from but at the same time he seems to like to see the positive side to everything and and he doesn't see the thing that everything everyone else sees which is that there is a sinister so there's a something going on behind this whale um, but he is, which, he is drawn to it. There's a couple of times when he, he just kind of, he's not allowed to go see the whale. They, they just tell him to go away, but he, he kind of sneaks in. Yeah, later on. And, and that's the, the moment when he un unwittingly discovers the sinister moment. So, yeah, this, this conversation between the circus owner and one of the attractions is this prince. And his and, translator. Yeah, and his yeah. translator. And the prince is kind of... Um, throwing off his shackles and he wants to go his own way and lead the people into a revolt. Yeah, one thing I found interesting was that this, the circus owner, circus master, he says that the, the prince is just a name I created for, for commercial reasons. Yeah. And I like this, that, that, that he's, he's brought the prince on uh, uh, 
it was his own Trojan horse in a way. He's brought the prince on to benefit himself, and and the prince is is completely overcome this situation. He's become he's overpowered the circus master, and he is his own thing now. So, what do you, do you want to talk about the score? Maybe briefly. Okay. What what's what do you have to say about the score? Me. Yeah. Shit. <laughs> okay. You wrote down um, the name of the composer. Yes. Okay. Um, okay, so I just want to talk briefly about the, the composer, uh, who's called Mihaly Lievig. Uh, I don't know if that's the correct pronunciation, but he's, um, the, the score is, is really pretty incredible. I mean, that, that's a common thing with, with all of Bellatar's films, actually. They, they've all got amazing scores, mm. the ones that I've seen. It's, um, my, it's mostly, mostly not a lot of music, though. There's, there's kind of like... No, the, yeah, there's, 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 one, not, there's, I think there's, there's a one. couple of... Well, at least there seems to be just a couple of songs, really... Uh, that, that that repeated a few times. Yeah. Um, that they tend to uh, come along in, in in important parts of the film. A very long take where the, the the rioters are walking along. There's no sound apart from the sound of, of marching feet um, for quite a long time. And the, the whole throughout the whole of the the destruction of the hospital they go to, they're destroying things. That there's no sound other than the the sound you know the sound that's put on like that there's no music um and then there's a, a pinnacle moment in that whole scene um and then the music comes on it's always a very sad tone i think um, and then this is, you know, I, I feel that it, usually the music comes in at a particular moment. It does reinforce. Yeah, it it really does. It may, maybe it's a, a bit of emotional manipulation, manipulation yeah. I guess. Uh, I don't always think that's a bad thing. I think that's just no. part and parcel of what filmmaking is myself. And it does, it does add uh, a lot of gravitas and beauty to the, the chaos that is in that, that town at that yeah, point. Yeah, it changes the film. I, I kind of feel we should talk about Workmeister. I didn't really understand it myself because I'm not a musical person anyway. Because he's saying he took the octave and moved it into five separate instead of ten black keys, there are five or something like that. That meant nothing to me. So I think I think basically what we know is as the notes on a keyboard, essentially yeah. what all our music in Western culture is made up of, are just um, what was decided by certain people at that time. So, oh, okay, so that that's why it that's why they he talks about it being perverted in that maybe in the same way that pop has sort of taken over our world now. Yeah, because you had like medieval in medieval music, you had loads of different modes, and they sound quite discordant to us now. In the same way, if you ever listen to some kind of Eastern music, like you know when you hear people singing in minarets, sometimes it sounds a bit odd to us because that's not using Western tones, if you know what I mean. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's millions of frequencies, but we've, we've tend to kind of like cordon off the frequencies to be, oh, that's C, you know, that's D, that frequency. And we can make music out of these 12 notes or whatever. Well, that's interesting because that immediately connects to uh, what I was talking about earlier, about, about our understanding of time and the universe. And that, that it, it's almost like the film is also a comment on, on the way culture um, uh, is constructed. Yes, definitely. And it's just because they had to decide at some point, we've got all these tones. I mean, how do we go about standardizing this music? I think that's what he's on about with Werkmeister. And change, going back and saying, oh, this set, uh, why do we have to go by this set of notes why can't we do this and which is kind of the theme underpinning the film why can't we just change it and go back to what's pure i guess does that make sense yeah were we recording all that uh i don't remember this of the film but there, there's an excerpt in the book or something uh where georg eventually has detuned his instrument uh tries the music of bach and finds that he doesn't like what he's done and then he eventually he ends up going back to what it was, yeah, to how it's set up. So there's this um, that does play a part later on when there is a kind of political unrest and revolt. But then 
it ends up just get reverting back to the original state of the film, doesn't it? Yeah. Okay, Sam, so what are your final thoughts on the film? Okay, well, I personally really like the film. Um, uh, I don't, you know, we have picked it out, admittedly. So, you know, I, I hardly yeah. picked out a film I don't like. But I, for me, it's, it's Tar's, one of Tar's strongest pieces. Uh, I know Saints and Tango is, is the one that's considered his masterpiece. But for me, this is the one that really changed it. It's, it's a bit, it's not a perfect film. Um, and I was saying about the dubbing earlier, uh, but I still, for me, it really stands out as something pretty strong. I and mean, maybe it connects to me a bit more. But um, I know I, I really like it. Anyway, what do you think? I agree. I I wasn't expecting to like it actually, but I was really really engaged by it, and uh, particularly the opening scene where it's just just one shot in a pub, a load of drunk guys talking about planets alignment and you've got that guy flashing his hands that <laughs> pretending to be the sun yeah and he's like manhandling all these people to create an eclipse with all these drunk people kind of the surreal nature i think it was quite interesting to me i quite like surreal things in surreal natures in films but in this one it was very still rooted in reality which i think something like a lynch film or tarkovsky generally it's much more abstract where the the image of the whale in the square at the end although that's a very surreal image it's, it, it almost could happen within those circumstances it's not beyond the realms of the realistic so i think that yeah it's not quite a dream world which i think is is what lynch, lynch is very that, dream it, it likes to go and uh, louis bunuel if you're familiar with his work um you know we we'll, we'll, we'll think they see that surrealism as a sort of the study of dreams and I don't think it's like that you know that there is a realism to it so yeah so I just felt it had the best of both worlds because of it and it just it, I think it made me appreciate the surrealism a lot more because when when you can just like do anything in a surrealist film and just um it tends to be a bit in self-indulgent to me but this wasn't and I think I haven't seen any other other Bellatar films but I think I will go and check them out all right, okay. Well, um, prepare yourself for Satan's Tango. Okay. I did not like Satan's Tango. No? <laughs> no. Um, All right. But each their own. I think I'm in the minority <laughs> from the reviews I've seen. All right. That's it for this week on Films on That. We might come up with a better title for this series in the future. But in the meantime, thanks for watching, thanks for subscribing, and we'll see you next time. Goodbye. Have you subscribed already? We, have, we don't even have a YouTube channel. <laughs> thanks for subscribing to nothing. Seriously, I'm yeah, but the first person is going to go, but no one subscribed. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you will subscribe tonight. I'll make some fake profiles. Thank <laughs> you.